Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. This segment was brought to you by Aurum Capital. If you are thinking about exiting or succession with a business today, you are joining a growing number of owners also considering the same alternatives. And if you've already heard that news, then you know exits or successions can be challenging, unless you can facilitate a recipe ahead of time and make your company prominent to attract attention and maximize your enterprise value in the broadest market. Anticipate and facilitate with Aurum Capital Connect today. For more information, please visit AurumCapConnect.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Grant Schreiber. He's the founding editor of Real Leaders. Grant, welcome to the show. Hi, good to be on the show with you. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I think what you guys are doing at Real Leaders is actually really innovative and cool, but maybe before we get into all that, let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. Well, I grew up in Cape Town, South Africa, Very cool. right on the tip of Africa, and I've been living there most of my life until two years ago when I came to the U.S., so now wow. I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Okay. So, so it was uh, very interesting growing up in South Africa, um, in the 80s and 90s in particular, um, I'm sure the whole world knew about apartheid and about what was happening uh, down south. Sure. And uh, it was really interesting times. And I see um, a lot of comparisons of what's happening in the U.S. today um, happening from uh, what I witnessed in South Africa many, many years ago. Sure. So you went to university in, in South Africa. Uh, walk us through that and what did you take and why? Well, I was always very creative since I was very young. And when I got to university age, much to the dismay of my parents, I decided to study fine art. And of course, I got the usual pushback on what are you going to do with that? And <laughs> that's not a real career. And, you know, <laughs> throwing <laughs> colors on the canvas is not going to make you any money. And I was like, well, this is what I want to do. So um, I ended up going into, um, into fine art. I studied it at the University of Cape Town for four years, and I got my degree in that. And I think uh, what I learned from, from fine arts was not necessarily the process. I'm certainly not an artist today, but it was the creative thinking, I think, which, which was my main takeaway from those years at university. Just being able to you know, have a sense of fantasy and a sense of imagination, which I think is also good for business as well. 100% agree. I, I think in, in a lot of cases, especially now, I, I think that's more important than, than ever, right? Exactly. I think uh, innovative, you know, those, those crazy ideas that people talk about um, when they talk about the beginning of Google or Apple or, you know, some cool product, it starts with that kind of crazy creative thinking. Um, you, just, you still need to have the ability to take it to market, but I think the initial idea is, is a creative pro process. No, 100% agree. So you get out of university. Walk us through your career up until real leaders and and moving to america sure um so i left university and i looked at at these qualifications i had in creativity and fine arts and i thought what am i going to do with this how am i going to put this into a practical um way of making a you know a career so i had joined up at the time with somebody called jonathan shapiro who is um, one of the leading cartoonists in South Africa. And we started talking about how we could actually use creativity for public health messages. At the time in South Africa, the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic was just starting. Right. And it was going crazy in, in sub-Saharan Africa, especially. And we were at, I think, about 1,500 HIV cases a day, new wow. cases. And so we looked at it and thought, we don't want to just be creative for the sake of it. We want to apply our creativity to something for the social good, to some kind of social impact. So we came up with the idea of doing photo comics 
uh, photo novellas, which is a genre of um, media which is not really looked at um, in a very highbrow way. It's certainly seen as you know cheap entertainment. Um, and we thought let's take that that format and try and turn it into something that's got some use with a public health message uh, as part of it. So we did that. We we hooked up with the departments of um, of health in South Africa and some leading doctors and AIDS researchers okay. and the Medical Research Council and the World Health Organization got involved as well. And we put out the world's first photo novella that um, promoted positive health messages around HIV. Oh, cool. um, so that was the first time I realized you could actually use creativity and, and uh, apply it to something with social impact. So I did that for a good couple of years, about five or six years. Um, we branched out into doing a photo novella for the very first democratic elections in 1994 in South Africa. That's when Nelson Mandela was voted in as the first democratic president. And at that time, you know, people forget that um, nobody knew how to vote. It was the first time anyone had ever voted, most, wow. of, the, most of the country. So we literally had to, to create media around teaching people, firstly, the necessity of voting, and secondly, how to actually do it. Wow. Nobody had a clue. You know, you've got, you've got people who are 70, 80 years old who had never voted in their life. It's just unbelievable. Wow. So, so we got stuck into that project as well. Um, then I came across um, somebody who ran a magazine called Leadership in South Africa, which was the, the leading uh, business and political magazine. And I decided to change tack for a little bit and get involved in the world of magazines. Um, I did that for about two years. Um, I was a creative director there. Um, and I then went back to my own business after that. Um, I decided at that point I wasn't, I wasn't very good at working for other people. <laughs> there, was an, there, was an, there was an entrepreneurial streak in me um, that didn't want to compromise, and I just felt more comfortable doing my own thing. So um, I went back to my own company again and started publishing magazines. And from there, I branched out into publishing a whiskey magazine for the world's largest whiskey festival, which actually happens in Johannesburg, South oh, Africa. Cool. Most people think it would most people would think it would be Scotland or somewhere in Europe or maybe South Korea, but um, where there's a big whiskey market, but uh, it's actually South Africa. So I published a whiskey magazine, I published a fashion magazine for South Africa Fashion Week and did um, a whole bunch of branding for uh, various companies, including the Laureus World Sports Awards in London, managed their brand for them uh, from South Africa for eight years. Wow. And sort of turned into a mini ad agency, I guess, in a way. But the emphasis was always on magazines and publications. And then that leads me to Real Leaders, um, which was founded 10 years ago. In fact, we're celebrating our 10 year anniversary in 2021. Wow, congrats. And That's huge. It is, yes. Ten years of a publication, especially when uh, publications are under such, such stress these days. Totally. Um, it's, um, it's, a, it's a magazine that focuses on good leadership, uh, ethical le leadership, and sustainable business. And when we started it ten years ago, nobody even knew what the word sustainability meant. Sure. We had to explain it. And over the years... Um, we uh, we just kept pushing the same message that you know you should put some kind of social impact into your business if you want to survive in the future. And at the beginning, everyone was like, "Well, that's nice to have. That's part of our corporate social responsibility program. It's um, it's not part of the main business. You know, we write a check for charity once a year. You know, we we have a photo opportunity with a giant check. Everyone grinning and shaking hands, and then we go back to our normal business." And, you know, we just kept hammering this message home that, in fact, this is where business will be mainstream one day. It's not just a, a one-sort charity feel-good. And so, you know, finally after 10 years, I think we've seen that it's become much more mainstream. And it started with things like fair trade coffee and um, sustainable clothing, organic cotton, you know, all those kind of things. And it's just snowballed into everyone being very, very aware of what they eat, what they wear, um, you know, what companies they, they contract with, where they want to spend their dollars. Um, there's a lot more awareness in the world. So with that in mind, in 2017, 
after publishing the magazine for seven years, we decided that there was probably going to be a mainstream uh, public market for the magazine. Um, and I just need to rewind quickly. We actually started as the official magazine of the Young President's Organization, YPO, Very which cool. is a big global organiza organization of CEOs. So how did that um, happen? And um, that took a very long time to get underway. Um, they, had, they didn't have a very strong communication um, network or strategy, rather, with their members at the time. And we approached them and said, you know, the magazine would be perfect for, um, you know, raising awareness among CEOs um, of how to possibly improve their business and to inject some kind of social impact in, into it for the future. And... It was uh, the white pair mandate is around doing good and helping their peers and, you know, looking around the world and seeing how they can help in, in, in a good way. So the magazine was a good fit for them. So we did that for about seven years and we still, we still uh, send the magazine out to all, I think it's 30,000 members in about 130 countries now. Wow. And it's, it's mostly CEOs, uh, company presidents. There's some world leaders involved as well. Um, and some some very big well-known names, and so the idea with that as well was instead of trying to influence things from the ground up, was to try and convince some of the world's business leaders to change their mind on certain things. In which case, the trickle-down effect through millions of employees and uh, supply chains and purchasing decisions could affect change as effectively, even more so. So that was the story with YPO. Interesting. No, I, I think that's that's very cool. But you were you were going to continue on the journey, and then I interrupted you. So do you want to keep going? Um, sure. Well, we we launched in 2017. We had a, a launch at Barnes and Nobles in New York for real leaders. Very cool. And we invited a, pa a panel of about eight experts um, across various fields to, to talk about the importance of the work we were doing. And we've been on newsstands ever since. So we, we're now in Barnes and Nobles. We're in Hudson stores and airports. And of course, the big question now on everyone's mind, as you see in the news, where there are magazine titles that have been around for decades, half a century and more that are, are folding or just becoming digital only, is what is the future of publications? And I think, you know, we were just talking earlier, uh, Kevin, about how the, um, the nature of things is changing so fast and that if we had to change our careers right now, it's not about being out of a job. It's really about transferring our skills onto a different platform. So, you know, the real leader strategy right now is obviously looking very strongly at digital. Right. Um, Cause that's when, that's where the audience is. And, you know, we, we just reinventing ourselves. Um, I think when you've got a strong brand and you've got a strong base of readers and supporters, then it's very easy thing to do. And, as I said earlier about the creativity of business, I've, I've seen water companies turn into media companies in France. And I've always been fascinated by things like that, where people take a company and they just turn it into something completely different. But as long as you've got solid fundamentals um, underpinning that company and a great brand and a, and a good solid leadership, I think you can pivot pretty easily. And I suppose if you had to look at the world right now, almost every single business in the world is pivoting. It's not just magazines needing to go from, you know, being made out of dead trees, <laughs> paper, yeah. into uh, into digital. It's got to do with everyone trying to reinvent themselves. So, you know, we kind of caught up with the much bigger picture right now of everyone trying to make sense of what's happening in the world and you know, seeing what's next and how they can actually reinvent their business into something that's more relevant. No, I, I think that that makes a lot of sense. And the other thing, too, is you have a large enough uh, readership that you could almost ask them and get their feedback as well, right, about what they would like to see or if they have any ideas. And you may or may not pursue any of them mm. or maybe some of them. or mm. But it's interesting, right, that you can get this sure. global perspective on what people could potentially like to see out, out of – you guys sure I, I think what we've always been on about is the positive and i think that's defined 
the Real Leaders brand from so many other media outlets. Right. The traditional media has always traded on drama, um, you know, conflict, um, right. and all kinds of other negative things to get attention and eyeballs and to and to create sales. And you've seen how the media have attracted, um, you know, huge animosity in this country, especially. Yeah. Um, there's a raging debate about, you know, whether you are left leaning or right leaning or what your agenda is behind the scenes. And we've never really taken note of those, those kind of debates. I mean, we left, it, left those for other people and we've just focused entirely on the good stuff. So, um, you know, we've had stories of people that we could easily have focused on that same drama, but we've just ignored it. And we, you know, we'd rather focus on what that brand or person is doing for good Yeah, the positive. to ensure that exactly uh, and that's kind of what's needed right now if you look in the world i think i said to somebody the other day that the new currency in the world is empathy Interesting. and yeah. it seems to be seems to be where the world's going everyone just needs to have a little bit more understanding everyone's a little bit more open to hearing a, a counter point of view uh to a degree yeah. um and i think you know we've always just been a brand and a magazine that's been looking for stories that have got some positive and there's too much negative already. So we don't need more of that. No, I a hundred percent agree with you. And I also think more and more people actually really care about trying to make the world a better place and, and more sustainable. And a lot of people care about, you know, climate change and global warming and companies, not just like polluting the planet. And so covering those types of things especially from a positive angle makes a lot of sense. Right. Mm. And, and I think people want to know, and then yeah. they also want to know how others are doing it so they can do it themselves in their companies mm -hmm. and their businesses. Have you found that? Yes, there's been a huge um, awareness that's been built over the years. And I think the most unfortunate thing for me is that it's become politicized. Yeah. Not just in the U S but, but globally, everyone's taken a side and I just find it crazy. I mean, I never would have guessed if you had told me 20, 30 years ago that the weather would become a political weapon, yeah, <laughs> or, you know, or, or, even, or even the post office would become politicized if you wanted to get more local. It's, um, you know, there are all these things which you just you can't believe um, have suddenly become political battlegrounds. And I think it's time for everyone just to, you know, even as, as a publisher, for, for us to kind of look at experts in their field, the scientists, the biologists, um, the doctors, those are the people we should be listening to. We shouldn't be debating these issues among ourselves. Um, I saw that in South Africa with the, the AIDS pandemic, where there was a lot of fear, a lot of myth, a lot of superstition around where it came from and how it was you know, spreading and what you should do. And I heard some, some crazy, crazy things. Uh, which I won't share here, sure. but of, I can imagine. of you know where H where HIV comes from and how you can cure it, and I just remember thinking at the time that you know you can't you can't debate these things um, certain certain medical or health facts it it just is what it is, and when you start putting a cultural spin on it or a political spin on it, it becomes very dangerous because then it spins into you know, 10, 20, 50, 100 different solutions, which are all just opinions, right. not facts. And it just, it just shows confusion. And what people do is they default to the easiest solution. So, you know, at, at the time we had um, a president in South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, who started questioning the role, you know, how HIV came about. And because he did that, it gave permission for, you know, 90% of the country to actually just take the easy route and go, oh, we don't have to worry about that because the president questioned it. Interesting. When it was a, a, cru a crucial part of the health, health message to saving lives. Right. So, you know, to get that, to get that debate between um, democratically debating it, which is, you know, free speech and having an opinion is very important, but at the same time, listening to the, the correct medical advice is such a balancing act. It really is between, um, you know, going into the, into the myths and the superstitions and and the facts. So I think it's very important that people think, you know, you know, go to the experts for advice. No, I, I think that's no, that's interesting. So, how do you guys then decide at Real Leaders 
how to actually get the people that are actually doing the sustainable stuff and, and the good in the world. Because there's a lot of people that can claim they're doing good and you actually look into them and you're like, wow, you're actually doing more <laughs> harm than good, right? Yes, exactly. I have a really interesting story about that. I interviewed um, the Mother Superior of Syria many years ago okay. at the Nobel, the Nobel Peace Summit. Wow. And, you know, she was sitting there in a nun habit with a crucifix around her neck, and she was talking about the horrors of Syria and the family she had saved and the, the terrible things she had seen. And about two months later, I came across a German uh, news crew who just took me on and said, how could you speak to her? You know, I was like, well, what's, what, what's wrong with speaking to the mother superior of Syria? And they started telling me all these stories about how she was implicated in, um, you know, all these, these things with the, the president of Syria. And uh, I, I just, I was a little shocked. I mean, it, the jury was still out on, <laughs> on the opinion of what was right and wrong with it. But I just suddenly realized that speaking to, a, you know, a, a nun was not always a guarantee that you were talking to somebody who, you know, on the surface looked as if they were just a, a pious religious person, that there were all kinds of other stories behind the scene. So I think that was one of the first instances that I can recall where I just suddenly realized that um, a lot of people who present themselves as one thing, there's always a backstory and there's always some other, other things behind the scenes. So you're exactly right on that point. You know, you just, there's good and bad in everyone. And, you know, to, to find real leaders on a regular basis is, is tough. We have our, our vetting uh, processes that we use to identify people. Okay. Um, I think it's a, it's a case of really, as I said, focusing on the good. Um, you know, you could look at any brand and any person and, and, and find the bad in them if you wanted to, but equally you can find the good. Yeah, that's And I think the, the more we highlight the good, the more people will latch onto that and in turn hopefully recreate more good or get some great ideas from what we've, what we've spoken about because um, innovation is such an important thing right now where people can actually just by reading one line from a quote of somebody we've interviewed might spark off an idea for them to, to try something or to just fine tune their business slightly um, and come up with a whole brand new way of doing, doing their business. No, totally. Right. And I think at least selfishly, that's almost why I've done this, this show for so long is, uh, you know, like if I can inspire somebody to, to just do whatever they've been trying to do for a while, but for whatever reason have just put it off and I, I've done it myself. Right. And, and then something mm -hmm. happens to your point, like you read a quote or somebody says something or something happens and it motivates you to start. And you're, you know, like if you can be that person for somebody else, even if it's just a small yeah. gesture, or, um, you know, I, I think that's, that's an inspiring in itself. Well, but but sure, I, I think one of the biggest, no, go ahead. The, one of the biggest lessons I think we've learned at Real Leaders is that leadership can come from anywhere. And in the past, I think people used to think you had to be qualified to, to have a voice. You needed to have a business degree. You needed to have gone to Harvard or have a, a Stanford business MBA, or you needed to be a world leader or a celebrity or a, a sports person. And what we've discovered at Real Leaders are some amazing people and amazing stories from Central Africa, uh, in rural Asia, um, all these far-flung places, and I've come up with these amazing ideas. And, you know, as an example, I've spoken to a, a Scottish salmon farmer okay. who became more, he became more productive and profitable in Scotland because he linked up with farmers in Rwanda, in Africa, Interesting. who taught him about uh, more sustainable fish farming. And you kind of think, well, surely the, you know, the first developed world would be more advanced in terms of those kind of things. What could a, a peasant farmer in Africa teach you? And they teamed up and they, they made a great team. And the efficiencies, because people forget that, you know, in a place like Central Africa where, where resources are scarce, people have made a plan to survive regardless. So, you know, if you come along as a, a Western business person yep. and take those those cost saving lessons, which is what they are. It's not about using less, it's about cost saving, streamlining your supply chain, using resources more intelligently. You can actually learn that from people with very you know, much less means than you. And if you apply that to your business in a developed world, you could save a small fortune and make a better product. So you 
find solutions to um, problems that people are scratching their heads to in the West, thinking they need to go into research and development for a couple of years and spend millions of dollars. And there might be some guy you could just team up with for free um, and, and learn a whole lot of really good innovative business practice. Yeah, interesting. And I'm assuming they just met online somewhere or, or how did they actually meet? Maybe not physically, but... I'm not, I'm not sure how they met, but okay. you know, one of the things I have seen from most of the people I interview is that they travel a lot. Yeah, okay. And you, cert you certainly, I mean, you can, you can research these things online these days on Google, but I, I don't, I think almost everyone I've interviewed and spoken to over the years, it's come about to physically being somewhere um, that's not home or their home country. And because they've looked at things through different eyes, yeah. they've recognized that there might be something new here. Even though it's not new to the local population, they're seeing it for the first time and thinking, you know, this is great and how can I apply this to my business? And also meeting interesting people who've got a different way of looking at the world. Yeah. And that's been stimulating enough for most of these uh, leaders to actually have that aha moment and put something into action. That's actually really good advice, right? Just being able to get different perspectives on, on something and see things and how things are done in different parts of the world mm -hmm. as you kind of travel around or, or even just like Googling the internet, right? Like you sometimes, in mm -hmm. a lot of cases, obviously most of us can't really travel that far these days with what's happening, but you can read about how people do a, tons of stuff online, right? And it, it, ha it does give you a different perspective on things for sure. Yes, it does. Um, and one of the things as well, which I've learned um, from real leaders is when I speak to younger people, yeah. is that the, the importance of travel for, for kids is really, really important. It just broadens your worldview, makes you realize that the opportunities out there, which you haven't thought of. And even if it's not a direct uh, quick fix, which it, it really is, but it, it starts broadening young people's minds to the fact that there are different ways of seeing the world. And in doing that, it gives you insight into different business opportunities sure well and maybe even other like business partners in other parts of the world right like it the the thing that i love about the internet probably the most is you can work with somebody across the globe or chat with somebody across the globe and it doesn't it, it's almost like you're working in next next to each other but you're like continents away across oceans and and it just doesn't matter anymore, right? No, sure. The gap is closed completely. It's, uh, it's quite amazing, actually. And I think, uh, you know, that's the new tool of business is, is uh, you know, being able to research these things. Sure. And there's some, incredible, there's some incredible tools, even with Google, where you can actually, you know, analyze huge amounts of data. You know, big data is leading the way in terms of what's next. Sure. And, uh, you know, instead of waiting to just, to, to uh, find out what your customer likes and doesn't like, you can actually predict it online with algorithms and big data much quicker. So that's one of the great pluses of technology right now. Sure. So I'm curious, you recently moved to America from South Africa. What made you make the move to America? Well, I've been publishing real leaders from the tip of Africa for <laughs> eight years. <laughs> okay. And and uh, you know my the rest of the crew and the team uh were here in portland oregon and i just thought moving closer would make things happen a little faster okay and then of course a year and a half in you've got lockdown and everyone, nobody sees each other anymore and <laughs> um yeah we're, we're all looking at each other over zoom screens again like i'm back in africa interesting um but but it's um yeah i think i've, I've got two young boys and i do want to get them plugged into a bigger economy right and that was that was a big part of it as well. Um, and also, I just love the diversity of thought in America, although some would disagree at this point in in, in America's history. It's a, it's got, it's a healthy, robust democracy. Um, you know, somebody said to me the other day, um, you know, why are things not centralized here? And I said, well, you've got the federal government, but you've also got all these states. And so um i said you know my opinion of it is if you had to try and take over um one or two states next to you because of your ideology you would still have another 50 to fight before you got national dominance <laughs> and i said that's that's the big deterrent right there is that there's enough diversity enough 
autonomy with, with different legislations and different states and different, different lifestyles and different cultures for it to be very difficult for things to become too centralized uh, too quickly and too easily. Um, and that's, that's what I love about America. It's just got, it's got enough checks and balances in place to ensure diverse thought. And, you know, regard, regardless of what, what you think or who you are in the world, I think you, you'll find your tribe in America. Um, you know, in South Africa, you might find a thousand people that are just like you. In America, you'll find a hundred thousand people that are just like you. And so I think it's a, it's a, very, it's a very welcoming culture and there are lots of, there's enough diversity here for you to find the like-minded people. Sure. So, so why Portland, just out of curiosity? Did you, did you set up in uh, Portland rest, originally? Well, the rest of the team's up here in Portland, so that was a logical place to start. Um, if I'd known about the rain and the gray skies, I might have considered differently. Okay. okay. <laughs> but, by then it, but by then, it was, it was too late by then. Uh, so I've invested in rain gear and an umbrella, which obviously marks me instantly as a foreigner because nobody uses an umbrella here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> That's awesome. But um, it's great. It's a good, wholesome outdoor, you know, lots of trees, fresh air, blue sky, for well, a couple of weeks a year. Um, and, you know, Cape Town, likewise, is a very outdoor lifestyle um, town. And so it's, it was a good fit. Oh, makes sense. So you've obviously interviewed a ton of really well-known people, and you've done um, Real Leaders for over a decade now and, and a bunch of other things mm -hmm. before that. Is there, like, a common thread or thing about these leaders or entrepreneurs that you – you see all the time that you maybe wish people did more of or would stop doing or, or maybe a bit of both or, or any advice that seems mm. to be that you seem to notice all the time that you wish more people knew about? I think there's what I've been surprised about is the, the humbleness of most of the people I've spoken to. Yeah. And, and the fact that they haven't come up with some, they haven't sat down after getting, a big degree or a big qualification and decided they're now going to, you know, reinvent the world. They've just, they've just come from a gut instinct, which mostly actually stems from their childhood. I mean, if I think of most people I've spoken to, they've actually, you know, I always ask them at the end, what is a real leader? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get, you know, Gandhi, you get Nelson Mandela, you get JFK. Um, most of the time people actually, um, recognize their parents, their mother or father as being the biggest influence to, and they could, they can, they can draw a direct line between their success today, um, to what their parents taught them. And sometimes it was just simple things. Um, example, when I spoke to Sarah, well, Sarah Blakely of Spanx, she yeah. was selling copiers door to door as a very unsuccessful, uh, salesperson for many years. And when she came home, her father would ask her every Friday at the dinner table, what have you failed at this week? And she couldn't understand it at first, but what, what her father was teaching her was that failure is fine. And that if, if you can recognize the failures and own them, then you've, you've kind of half conquered it because you, at least you're aware of it rather than just failing and not knowing why. Interesting. So he gave her criti critical thinking about you know, why you need to actually focus on your failures and learn from them because if you don't learn from them, then you just fail again, the same right. thing. And so then of course she became famous by, I think she cut the legs off a pair of, um, of stockings one evening to go out and she put them on and she, she said to me, well, my butt looks great in this. I wonder if other women would like it too. And, uh, the short version of that is she's now one of the richest women in the world, yep. multi-billionaire. And so, um, I think the lesson for her was just perseverance. You know, she, she didn't give up. And the other thing is just recognizing that big idea when it hits, because, you know, I think any of us would have cut, you know, the, the bottom of a pair of um, stockings and gone, okay, well, that's it. And left, you know, moved on with your life. But it, it's an ability to actually spot that opportunity and scale it in your head at first to think, will this be something other people like and want to have? And then having the bravery to, to do it. And most of the people didn't have big resources. They didn't have a lot of money to put into it. 
Um, you know, I've spoken to people who've started businesses with a, with a couple of hundred dollars, a couple of thousand dollars, sure. and gone on to make million, millions and billions. So that's not actually a criteria for success, the initial investment. Um, it's, it's just a steady commitment to your idea and mostly people that you know, just using your networks yeah. and you know, capturing the imagination of people with, with some crazy idea. Um, the other person that comes to mind is Forrest Whitaker. Okay. He told me that the reason he does peacekeeping in Sudan, which not many people know about, he's got the Whitaker uh, Peace and Development Initiative, which he started up many years ago. And he's busy working in Sudan, in East Africa, in conflict areas. So, you know, most people look at Star Wars and go, okay, well, we know who Forrest Whitaker is. They look at other Hollywood movies. But they have no idea that in real life he's actually playing out those roles, um, you know, pretty accurately in terms of keeping the peace in certain countries. Interesting. And he's doing it very quietly, but he attributed that to the empathy that his mother gave him. His mother used to work in a, a home for intellectually challenged children, okay. and it took a lot of patience. And she used to come home every day and tell him about it. And she just got rid of all the myths and the stigmas around that particular issue with, with Forrest while he was growing up. And so that empathy that he now has for helping kids in Sudan comes directly from his mother when he was growing up. Interesting. And so um, he's made a business of it too. I mean, he's got a foundation and he's got buy-in from a lot of influential people in the world. And it's, uh, you know, once again, that goes straight back to his parents. No, and then on the other on the other end of this sorry no, no, <laughs> on the other end of this on the other end of the scale um i met jane goodall um at her 85th birthday in los angeles last year and from being inspired by young people and hearing about how a lot of leaders and celebrities were influenced by their parents um i ended up until midnight um, at her birthday party uh, talking with Jane Goodall and just thinking to myself, goodness, she's 85 and everyone had left. There must have been about 300 people there. At midnight, she was one of five people left behind. Sled and left. And she travels, I think, out of 365 days, I think she travels about 300 days a year around the world at her age. And it was just such an insp inspiration to realize that you're never too old to make a difference. And of course, she's got a long, you know, history of, of things she achieved when she was younger, but she's not slowing down. She's not retiring or thinking, you know, my time's done. I've done what I needed to do. And she's slipping into easy retirement. She's still, she's still going flat out. That's very cool. And um, yeah, it's great. And so we had her on the cover of um, last one of the editions of Real Leaders last year. And it was actually one of our best selling editions. Wow. And you know, I just said to the team, it's amazing. You have an 85-year-old woman on the cover. It becomes a bestseller. Times have changed. You know, I think people are looking at, at deeper meanings than the uh, airbrushed celebrities that we used to on some of the more glossy mags out there. Sure. Yeah. No, I, I think that, that makes sense. I, I think, well, in a lot of cases, it's I think people can relate to those people more, right? Like... And mm. they can try to at least emulate um, some of the things that those people have done or are doing where, I don't know, and people would probably hate me for saying it, but, like, but finding that same kind of motivation or inspiration from a glossy pop star or reality star mm. is probably very challenging if, if it can be done at all, right? Yeah, sure. It's It's changed dramatically the last well this year especially where yeah. there was this this cult uh, following of celebrities and what they were eating what they were wearing what they were doing what they were tweeting and um, they haven't gone away completely but you've suddenly seen that the people that are important in the world are not the the people that we we used to look at last year and think the same thing yeah they've almost a lot of people have almost become irrelevant um and i think it's because everyone's facing hardship directly and you know, I think people's priorities are swinging towards more authentic people, people with empathy, 
um, and people just giving hope, totally. which was actually the theme of our of our latest uh, Real Leaders magazine. We actually uh, spoke with 16 people, around, well-known people around hope, just to be able to show people that you know things carry on regardless, and here's some people who've got some great ideas on how to achieve it. Interesting. No, I, I think that's great. Is there any, uh, maybe like a couple tidbits from, from that issue that you found kind of inspiring? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, we had uh, Greta Thunberg in it, um, who, not because of her climate activism, but more because she's managed to, to change quite dramatically in the last year, especially from a climate activist to a youth activist. So it was more, she was more chosen for, for that 16 um, person section because of her transition from just going on about the climate and global warming to looking at much broader issues. Interesting. So she was one. We have uh, Natalie Portman in there, not because she's an actress, but because she's actually just invested in a women's only soccer team. Very cool. And so instead of, you know, celebrities are always lending their name to a cause, but she's actually put her own money into it and invested in it, which I think shows a bit more of a commitment. Sure. Um, and then we have uh, Fabian Cousteau, the grandchild of Jacques Cousteau, oh, cool. uh, the ocean uh, con conservationist. Yeah. And he's busy building some underwater, um, it's a, he's calling it an underwater space station. So what he does is he's doing experiments underwater, which he thinks might actually unlock uh, cures for disease and all kinds of other, other problems. And so in the same way that people, astronauts go up into space to test things in space, which they then use that information and data to solve problems on Earth, medical or um, scientific, he's doing the same, but underwater. Interesting. And he's calling himself an, uh, calling himself an aquanaut, which is a whole new term. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So, so those are just some examples of the people we have. Sure. Very cool. So... I'm curious then, how do you guys decide sometimes who to reach out to? And I'm sure like sometimes people can do it. Sometimes they probably can't just from a number of reasons. And then I'm assuming that people also pitch you guys ideas. But if somebody wants to get um, their business mm -hmm. or, or their person featured in Real Leaders, how do they go about doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, you could send an email to us um, at editorial at realleaders.com. Uh, real leaders has a dash in between. So it's okay. real-leaders.com. So, you know, just fire an email through to us. Uh, we all get to see it. And, um, you know, we look at various factors. What we, what we try and avoid are just press releases where people are trying to push a, a product or a brand. Um, you know, we are looking for, for uh, some kind of leadership in a certain sector. Right. It's made a positive influence in the world and changed people's lives for the better. Right. Um, so we do get we do get a lot of a lot of pitches that are off key. Right. Um, I had a pitch a couple of years ago from a company that was wanting to do a story on vegan bullets, and so I said, okay. "Well, what is that? What, how does that work?" And they said, "Well, the bullet dissolves inside the animal, which means it doesn't get tainted with um, you know metals, which." means that when you eat the meat, you're not going to get slightly poisoned by, you know, toxic metals. So I said, well, um, yeah, but vegan bullet is, is not exactly the best, <laughs> the best term for something that's already killed an animal. Uh, anyway, it was full of complications, but, you know, we've, we've had some interesting pictures before. Vegan sure. bullets is one of them. Yeah, interesting. But we get, lots of, we, get, we get lots of people with great ideas, and we just never know where the next big idea is coming from. And we do encourage people you know, regardless of what kind of brand or business they're in, whether they're young or old, uh, doesn't make a difference. As I said earlier, we're finding, you know, leadership and great ideas coming from unusual places. Sure. Well, and I also think, too, sometimes being inexperienced and, and not really understanding the good, bad, or what you can and can't do in a certain vertical or industry can be a really big plus. It could also be a negative, but I think... The, the people that sometimes really disrupt an industry come into an industry with like brand new ideas because they haven't kind of been jaded by that industry yet. And then on the flip side of mm. that is you have people that have been around for, for decades that have just kind of seen things and, 
and can give really good insight because they've kind of been through it or been there and done that type stuff. Right. So, and I think yeah. more and more people care almost about both sides now. It's like, well, I want to hear mm. what somebody that's been around for a, bun- a number of years has to say about this, but I also want somebody that's kind of fresh eyes at this thing. Right. Mm. Yeah, sure. And one of the things I was looking at a few weeks ago was um, there's a futurist called Peter Diamandis, and in his new book, he actually was talking about the fact that coming up with a new business solution these days might be as simple as just looking around wherever you're standing and going, that object I'm looking at with the introduction of the internet or Bluetooth in it, what, what can that become? Sure. And you know, you could have 20 new ideas in a few minutes just by doing something like that. So that's how fast innovation is changing, especially with technology enabling it. But, you know, you've got, you know, once again, the diversity of thought is so important. You can have uh, a rich and a poor person having a discussion where a new business idea could come about. It's not necessarily because the rich person is more educated that the better idea is going to come from that person. Right. And when you start mixing and matching, that's where you start coming up with the, the interesting combinations that might lead to something great. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense, but we're kind of coming to the end of the show. So how about we close mm-hmm. with mentioning where people can get more information about real leaders and any other links you want to mention? Sure. Well, the, the, the logical place would be our website, uh, real-leaders.com, where you can find uh, lots of stories around uh, sustainable business. We've been focusing the last couple of months on uh, COVID-19 and post-pandemic stories, just trying to come up with some stimulating ideas of what people could start thinking about sure. and how other people are leading, leading from home. So there's some great resources there. And, you know, next time we're traveling, once the airports are fully open, um, the best place to grab a copy is at the Hudson through the airport. Okay, cool. And then, of course, Barnes & Noble as well for the print edition. And online, you can also subscribe to a digital edition for the year, which uh, gives you free digital downloads and you have access to the entire um, uh, backlog of uh, real leaders uh, issues on through that digital subscription. So you would probably get about another 20 or 30 issues just by subscribing today rather than waiting to you know build them up over the next year. Very cool. Well, Grant, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day, man. Thanks, Kevin. It's been great speaking with you. You as well. Thank you. Okay, bye. Okay, cheers. Bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.